Water Review Committee meeting of Tuesday, February 11th, um, 2020. At this time, I will move. I move that the school committee meet in executive session to be returning to open session pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 21A, for Purpose 3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the teachers' <coughs> union because an open session may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the school committee. And the chair so declares. And at this time, we'll take a roll call vote. <coughs> oh, for, I second your motion. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mark, I. McLaughlin, I. Pennington, I. McKinnon, I. McKinnon, I. And at this time, it's unanimous. And the motion has passed. The school committee will now meet in executive session pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 21A, for purpose three, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the teachers' union because an open session may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the school committee. The school committee will be returning to open session this evening. Thank you. Welcome to the East Bridgewater School Committee meeting of February 11th, 2020. And um, we already opened the meeting, so at this time I would ask everyone to please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance <coughs> to, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you, everyone. It's nice to see a full crowd in our library tonight. Thank you all for coming. Um, <clears throat> at this time, I would take a motion to, <clears throat> we're, moving the, we're moving an action item up to the top. I would take a motion to approve our school committee um, budget to certify a level service school department budget for our fiscal year 21 in the amount of $21,502,223. So moved. Second. Moved by Gordon, second by Teresa. Any discussion? Uh, go ahead, Tim. Um, I, I just want to say, you know, I had a chance after the presentation last week to, <clears throat> to talk to um, Superintendent Legault for, for um, a length of time. And, you know, it, it's nice to see that, you know, we're talking about, you know, strengthening things in this district that have a lot continued to build on professional development, continue to, um, build on adding positions to the district that um, there's clear evidence here that we're moving in the right direction and I'm, I'm actually really happy to see this it was something I was concerned about when I first ran last year it's nice to see that there's progress in that direction in the upcoming year uh, same as Tim I, well I met with uh, Superintendent Legault and, and Mr. Shea this afternoon uh, they answered uh, all my questions uh, and I feel good also about the budget um, and uh, appreciate all the work that goes into it. John, I don't know how you do it, but I appreciate you doing it. Uh, and I appreciate all the work that goes into making our schools as good as they are uh, with what we have to work with. Not that $20 million is a small amount of change. It's a lot of money, but um, God knows we'd always like it to be more. But I think with what we have and what you've been able to do with it, I think is admirable and I appreciate it. Thank you. And I, too, have been having ongoing meetings with the superintendent, uh, the assistant superintendent, John Shea, and our town administrator, and I feel comfortable with the number that we'll be certifying. And I think it's important to thank Mr. Noble as well. Um, <clears throat> I've talked to him, I've talked to Liz, I've talked to John, I've talked to Gina. Um, I, I just think it's important that, you know, we have somebody who's reached out and really worked with us. and has allowed us to, you know, at least keep our services level. We'll be funding our new positions ourselves, which thank you very much, Liz, for um, the adjustment council is we're, we're putting in. I think that's critical to, to us moving forward as a district. Um, and I think we'd all like to see more. I don't think there's anyone, 
at this table that wouldn't want to see a higher budget, and I think we'll all continue to push for that, but that we should um, move forward with where we are and get ready for town meeting. And to your point, Teresa, we are funding those five new positions out in our, with our, our own budget, so we're not going to town meeting asking for that. We're really trying to make this a sustainable budget using the resources that we have. So I think we've all had opportunity to ask questions, be given information, and really understand <coughs> where this number is coming from and what it's being used for. Any further questions or discussions? At this time, uh, we have the motion, so I, all in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. And next up, we have a report from the East Bridge Order Junior Senior High School Student Advisory Council, Kiara Lonergan. So I don't have any updates for the past two weeks, um, but I would like to comment on the math email that went out. From what I've heard, students have found that very helpful. Uh, the LGBTQ club is having a bake sale during high school lunches where everything will be a dollar. A unity club is currently having our spirit week. Monday was meme day, Tuesday was culture day, Wednesday is decade day, Thursday is blackout day, and Friday is fresh fit Friday. And student senate is currently planning for March Madness. Okay, what exactly is fresh fit Friday? I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> it's where you dress up a little and look nice, look nicer than usual for school. Oh, nice. Oh. Look, look fresh. Is Ooh, that this this Friday? <laughs> Thank you. Next up, we have Superintendent Legault. I'm going to heal my time to the three principals, uh, Mrs. Byrne, uh, Mr. Sylvia, Mr. Gentile. There were some questions that came through about vaping, talking about the map testing. It's going to come up with uh, Mrs. McPartland and Mrs. Dupre, but I'd like to have the three principals come up to the table um, and answer any questions, if there's any Clarifying questions that anybody need. I know that I got a question on vaping the other day. Um, there was a question on some enrollment issues and uh, teacher assistance uh, at the central school. Um, but if anybody else has any questions, I can, the principals are certainly here to answer them. And they do have a, a small presentation for the, for, tell you a little bit about what's going on in each of their schools. Welcome. Okay. What? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to update you on our preschool registration and enrollment. The last time we were here, I think we were just starting that process. And so um, I'm happy to report that next year we will be offering two five-day full-day preschool classrooms. Uh, in addition, we will still have our three-day full-day and our two-day full-day programs in addition to our half-day model. Uh, so we're excited about that. Our enrollment is projected to be at least the start of the year, probably flat to where we are now today. So probably about 116 students to start the year. Um, students age into our uh, two-day program uh, as three-year-olds when they come in from early intervention. So we will continue to pick up students into next year as, opposed, as well as students that may move to the district that require our uh, preschool programming. So that's great news. Is that, is that an increase over your current preschool programming or is that the same? As far as programming, it's an extra session of the five-day full day. Okay. As far as total enrollment of students, it's <coughs> not so okay. what this year's was. No space issues? Nope. We have plenty of space for the preschool, so that will work out just fine. So you did, from the last time you were here, you were talking about opening another section, you did do that? We did. Correct. We had the waiting list. Great we were job. waiting to make sure we could secure enough students and interest. Because as you recall, our uh, preschool program is tuition-based. So the tuitions pay for the salary of the staff and the ISAs that are involved in that program. So we need to be able to have enough in order to fund those positions. So happy to report that we were able to make that work. And the interest um, townwide was you know, very popular. So we're able to offer that to the community. We're excited about that. Currently, we are in our kindergarten search. And so we have some initial census numbers. They are not complete. They'll be complete come the end of the month, beginning of March. Um, but we're out seeking for kindergartners as we speak. Currently, right now, we have 127 that we have identified and know about. Um, but the census numbers will increase. Um, so we'll see. I'll keep you posted on that to let you know what we'll be looking for for next year for kindergarten staffing. Currently this year we have seven full-day kindergarten programs. Um, based on the numbers, you know, we'll see whether or not we need to increase that. 
Um, I did want to clarify when I talk about kindergarten, I guess there was some question about this classroom size at the kindergarten grade level. Um, the range in classrooms um, for kindergarten classroom size is 19 to 22, currently this year. Um, I think there might have been some information. People were concerned that perhaps it was high around 26. That is not the case. Um, but just to uh, let you know of that, that's something that we do monitor. And based on enrollment, um, you know, I'd advocate for you know an additional teacher if need be. Um, a few years ago, we had 160 students. A few years prior to that, we had closer to 170. So obviously, there's some fluctuation. Um, we really don't know that though until we get those census numbers and we start doing that registration for kindergarten. Hopefully, that clarifies it. Any other questions that were out there regarding that topic? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Are there any ad additional questions specifically? Be happy to answer them. No? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kate. Uh, good evening, everyone. Nice to see you all again. It hasn't been too long since the last time we were here. Uh, <laughs> just with regard to any updates uh, at the Mitchell. Um, just finished second round of map testing, which we try and keep you guys in tune with. Um, so uh, Ms. McPartland, who's here tonight, uh, has met with our teachers to look at the growth of, their stu of each of their classes uh, from the fall administration to the winter administration, talking about goal setting with students, things that we can do in the classroom to try and impact their growth uh, to the spring. In addition to that, um, the MCAS schedule has been finalized and just recently shared with staff and will go out to parents. Um, so we're in the, uh, the preparation mode for MCAS testing. There's a lot involved with that and uh, thank you to the staff members that have already contributed a lot to that process um, because there's a lot of people that it involves to make sure that we get all the information together. Um, lastly, just you know, with regard to the budget, um, you know, thank you to the school committee for supporting the budget that was put forward um, with respect to the positions that are um, anticipated to be added at the Mitchell School. Um, that's a huge, huge benefit for us and for our students. It will significantly improve the programming at the Mitchell School uh, with regard to special education in particular, which is an area um, with respect to MCAS achievement has been an area that we've really been trying to target because it's been an area that we have consistently struggled in terms of student achievement. And with the additional special education staff, by adding special education teachers, as opposed to teaching assistants, we're, we're improving the, um, uh, the quality of our services that we're providing, not only to special education students, but it in turn trickles down to regular education students as well. Um, so, you know, really important. Um, definitely anticipate that to have a significant impact for us and, and again appreciate everyone's support. But happy to answer any questions if you have any. Andrew, I have a question only because the vaping is here and it's, it's aimed at you, but I'm going to ask Andrew, has the vaping problem trickled down to the middle school much? Uh, we have dealt with a couple of isolated incidents. Um, dealt with them, you know, immediately and, and uh, I feel effectively. Um, that said, you know, we're always on alert because, you know, you see it everywhere. And unfortunately, kids have pretty easy access to this stuff. Um, so, you know, we're trying to find ways to educate the kids while they're at our building. So hopefully that'll have an impact when they come up to Mr. Sylvia and, you know, we can help to positively contribute to the problem. I have to say, I've been, I, I was impressed and I haven't watched all of them, but I've, I've seen notes about them. Almost every medical drama on network television has now addressed a teen in vaping crisis. And hopefully some of that will trickle down. But it, it hasn't hit you widespread yet, thank God. Fortunately not. Thank God, right? and hopefully we can prevent that. I mean, you, you feel you have the resources to I think at we least do. Educate, I... educate and try to prevent. I mean, there's only so yeah. much we as I mean, I think based on what you see, um, you know, in other districts and in the media, it's it's a real rampant problem. Um, and despite the best efforts of people, there are still issues. And I mean, I think for me uh, personally, it starts with um, educating the kids about what they're doing because just simply, you know, punishing them when it happens doesn't necessarily, you know, change the behavior. So if we can try and get to it while they're at the Mitchell School and begin get them, getting them thinking about it. Hopefully that'll curb the issue, you know, as the years go by. Thank you. Sure. 
Thank you. Not related to vaping, but I just want to say I got invited to my son's third grade uh, Valentine's for Veterans um, ceremony last week, and it was awesome. He was thrilled that I could make it, and I thought it was really nice and touching uh, and a little disconcerting that I'm not the young veteran anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was really nice, so that kind of stuff, keep that up. Absolutely, and uh, shout out to Melissa Leonard, who I think is uh, in the audience tonight, who has organized that activity for several years. The activity is a great opportunity for students to make connections with veterans and to understand the importance. Um, you know, and it and it takes teachers that are special like Melissa to, to make those things happen continuously year after year. So great event. Thank yeah. you for coming. Thank you. So do the wall too. Pardon? You do the the veterans wall too. You did a, that's I don't know how long's my kid been under there for years. We had all the pitch, the veterans on the walls. Um, you don't remember that? That was like three yeah. years ago. They do a veterans day. I didn't see it this year. Mr. Pray, you want to? Oh yeah, that's Veterans Day. <laughs> Not Valentine's Day. <laughs> thank you. High school, Jeff. Uh, thank you for having us uh, again. We appreciate it. Uh, as far as high school, a lot of activities. Just tonight alone, a lot of activities. Uh, our our uh, guidance counselors had a college planning night tonight. Uh, it was excellent. I want, about over 50 families were there, uh, by I count. Uh, and it was great information for a lot of our sophomore and, and, and junior families, um, which we will post. I asked them if we could get their information and post it on our website just for everybody who wasn't able to attend. Did a nice job, Mrs. Lyons and uh, Mrs. Fahey. Um, but a lot of, we're getting busier as, as we approach winter break. Um, we are finalizing our program of studies. Uh, we met today with our guidance staff to start looking at uh, Mrs. Clifford shared the um, PowerPoint that's going to go out to the presentation for the students, which is earmarked for March 3rd through the 9th, the week of that, uh, so we can present our course selections and the process. Uh, we have streamlined it a little bit for the 7th, 8th, and 9th graders. Um, we are establishing our 9th grade to take business and computers uh, as part of their rotation of all the common um, <clears throat> subjects that they have to take. So we're, we're on the cusp of, of establishing that, looking forward to doing that as well. We have parent conferences coming up a couple of weeks. Uh, we, our staff has been incredible as far as reminding me to, to, to let them know um, about the upcoming dates. So we, I asked the staff to uh, put forth a new recommendation. Um, for our students. So every student will receive a level recommendation for next school year. So from eighth grade all the way through uh, 11th grade that, that they're going to make a recommendation for the levels that we have. Um, and hopefully it'll establish a conversation with, with families uh, during parent-teacher conferences about, you know, this is the recommendation, this is the reason, these are the reasons why we made this recommendation. Um, it's okay to disagree. Uh, respectfully that's that's the whole purpose of having a conversation uh, to do that so we can um, really start that conversation going forward for families so uh, that'll that'll be upon us soon same thing MCAS we where uh, mr. Bosch is working diligently with mrs. Clifford um, to establish um, a schedule for our MCAS uh, we just wrapped up our um, retest in biology so we're getting we're gearing up for uh, training the staff in uh, our new MCAS uh, 2.0 for uh, the online process. Uh, we'll be doing that the first week of, May, of March. So uh, we have a lot on the plate right now. It's starting to pick up um, with our busy time. Uh, as far as the vaping goes, which I know that was a question that I received. Um, so I had uh, Ms. Anderson and Mr. Bosch run the numbers for me uh, this week. And, and we've had 28 um, disciplinary actions for vaping this school year. Unfortunately, the number has increased from, I understand, from a year ago. Uh, since January 2nd, we've had 12 incidents um, where students have been disciplined for vaping. Um, about 10% of those students are repeat offenders, unfortunately. So we talk about education. I think education is definitely something that we're discussing going forward. Uh, we're working hand-in-hand uh, -hand with Dr. Williams and EB Hope Coalition. Uh, to establish some sort of process and educational component to uh, a, a disciplinary action, maybe a tiered system that we, we're discussing. 
you know, uh, first time offense, second time offense, third time, fourth time, what, what have you. Uh, I've reached out to local schools to see what they are doing through my Lighthouse group uh, to see what they're doing as far as the consequences and if they have a tiered pro, uh, process. A lot of schools are moving towards a tiered process of discipline with an educational component. Uh, so we've established extended detention. We look at that, that might be a, a way to go. An extended detention with an education, they have to write a reflection, something, and have to hand it into the office. Um, you know, going forward for the next school year. We're not gonna implement it now because we haven't done that to those individuals that have been caught. So, but going forward, that's, these are unfortunately the things, it is reactionary, but we feel that, you know, education is something, it's sad, I don't, I, don't, I think families need to realize how addictive this is. Um, it's, you know, a small cartridge on a vape is, is the equivalent to over a pack of cigarettes. Um, the tobacco is, is not pure, it's um, processed and it's, it's the, I mean, like you said, any medical uh, journal or, or documentary or any medical professional you speak to will, just talks about how bad this is health-wise for individuals. Uh, so we really like to get that word out there for that. Um, so uh, we were not thrilled with the numbers, the statistics, but we, we feel that we are being incredibly vigilant. Our, our staff has been excellent in the hallways in uh, working, you know, popping in the bathrooms when they can. Um, we've asked a couple times. They've responded <coughs> amazingly. A lot of the times the teachers are the ones who are, are, are unfortunately catching the students and they'll call down the office. We'll go and, and, and retrieve that student. So um, we can't do it alone. It's only, uh, you know, two sets of eyes in the main office administratively. Um, so they've been incredibly supportive and fantastic for us uh, in the building being our eyes and ears. So um, the more vigilant they are, the better I think the more we can curb um, these incidents. Um, would love to eliminate it, but unfortunately, uh, you know, there's, there's, there are a component where people are gonna do it because it is highly addictive. So we are working together as a team in, in collaboration with everyone in the building and, and we're trying to stay on top of it as much as we can. So any questions that I can answer for that? I just want to say thank you and thank you to all the teachers and staff in the hallways monitoring the bathrooms. I know that um, for kids it's become commonplace and there's a level of well it is what it is so you know they're not going to snitch they're not going to bring it forth but I also know on the flip side there are kids who will avoid using a bathroom because they know at certain periods there's a group of kids that are in there vaping and they just are not socially strong enough to walk in and say excuse me I need to use the rest restroom and that's not fair to those kids because they're not safe at school in their mind you know they're not able to use the restroom so thank you for being diligent and addressing this um, and it is sad because it is addictive and there are kids I know who feel that why stop now I've been doing it for long enough I've already done the damage so you know there's also that misconception out there for some of these kids so I think the educational piece is very very important thank you thank you mm -hmm. Karen and uh, okay I know there was questions that you had asked me and I said that I would bring the, mm -hmm. uh, them along. It's easier for them to answer the questions straight if you have any questions. But I know that Jay has a few things that he wanted to bring up. Um, one of them was talking about those adjustment counselors, uh, why we're putting, um, uh, trying to get more inclusionary classrooms uh, starting at the Mitchell School, um, trying to put two teachers in a classroom. Um, that has started. Um, in a few of the classrooms, uh, we started in six, now we're down to <coughs> four, four, five, and six. We four, have five, four, five, four, five, and six, and we'll have one in, uh, and then third. With the budget so, being certified, thank you guys. We're, we're, we're gonna bring one into third as well um, to help develop all students and to work with all students. Anytime that you look at it and you have two teachers in there, um, best practices show that, that it really supports all kids and all learning. So I think that inclusionary process is really important with the UDL that the district's doing as well, um, and the teachers are part of, the, the uh, Dr. Williams is part of, as that project goes on, I think it just helps and, and benefits all students. Uh, one of the things that we did find when we looked at our numbers, and, and one of the reasons why we're looking at, at school adjustment counselors in particular, is social emotional learning is huge. It's, it's 
not only huge in the, in the state but huge across the country right now. The numbers are, are seem to be jumping exponentially when you when you look at any kind of literature out there. Kids are getting getting anxiety diagnosis now sometimes as early as kindergarten, first grade. Behavioral behavioral um, um, acting out is, is being seen because they don't have the language for that. So we're trying to work with expanding that. For us, we've seen a, an increase of three cases just over the uh, first half of the school year um, from last year in the first half of the school year. So our, our social emotional numbers are increasing as well. Three cases district wide or? District wide, just as, as a, so we had one case last year that was a social emotional initial. I, I understand. Yeah, now that. moving up to three in this first half of the year. <clears throat> So it's almost threefold. Yeah. I don't know if there's any questions you have specifically. I have a question about the special ed position in the third grade. So what, what does the model on that look like? Do they just follow ELA and math, one classroom, multiple classrooms? What, what is it? So the, they follow multiple classrooms currently. Mm -hmm. So that third grade would follow that kind of same model that the okay. five and six do. They do have a small pull-out kind of piece. Okay. The kids need some extra kind of supports but they go back to the classroom stuff. pushing as much as possible. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but, it, but they basically work with like two, te two, two different teachers, teachers and they go back and forth. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's only, how many, is it, there's currently one special ed teacher in third grade? Currently one. Mm -hmm. How many, uh, all right. So again, as we look at the numbers coming up. Yeah. Um, see where we're at at Central School and see where our numbers are. But we do certainly want to fill up. Uh, we have been working with this model at the Mitchell School, working with Andrew, um, trying to fit the model into Mitchell School first to see what, what's happening, how it's working. Um, we have seen some increased um, scores, growth. I, hate, I don't like the word scores. I don't want to see. That's not really why kids are in school, but we do want to see growth. Um, and we want kids to do well, feel uh, supported in their classes. Uh, feel supported as they um, follow the programming throughout pre-K through 12, and if that's and that was the school that we started with was at Mitchell School. Andrew, sorry, I just want to see your question. Sure. Um, so for several years, the, the model was that um, there was a significant number of students that were in a pullout setting for ELA and math. Mm -hmm. Those students would be exclusively taught by a special educator. Okay. And when possible, the special educator would, would be incorporated into inclusion classes as well. But in their absence, we would have a teaching assistant who would fulfill that role. Okay. Um, in my opinion, you know, obviously, I think bringing in a certified teacher uh, to be able to provide inclus inclusionary services, to be able to work hand in hand with a, with a regular ed teacher, uh, to plan together, to yep. deliver the, you know, the instruction. And, and that is, in just another piece of your question, it's math and ELA, but there's often times where the special educators sure. are working in science and social studies. Uh -huh. um, at times they're, they're pulling students out maybe for a 30 minute intervention of some sort. Um, but bringing in the extra special ed teacher is taking the quality of our services to another level. Uh -huh. um, and it will, result in, it will result in a need for less teaching assistance, uh -huh. um, but it will, you know, replace those people with a certified teacher who, again, we've seen it already with the addition of additional staff in the other grade levels that we've already seen um, the results of, of those changes. With respect to the specific model, I mean, it changes sure. based on you know, right. year to year and right. what the kids' needs are, and we try to maximize, you know, how we can utilize the special educators, but also want to put them in a position to work with teachers that they can build a relationship with and students right. that they can build a relationship with. So, um, so the special education teacher will do B and C grid services on the kids that they're assigned to the case so where prior, prior to that they would do only the C grid and an aide would do the B grid? Primarily. That okay. wasn't yeah. true in 100% of cases, okay. absolutely. Um, but that was generally, generally, generally. That, okay. had, that had been the model and we've been gradually moving toward okay. making sure that special educators are the ones that are you know, delivering special Good. design instruction. I like the push to inclusion. Like Sorry to jump in. I just wanted to. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if there's any other questions I have. I have forgot. No. Nope. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. I want to follow up on uh, decap and angst. 
So we did have, um, I just want to add that we did have final principal approval from all three buildings on a DCAP, which is District Curriculum Accommodation Plan. So hopefully that will go into place you know, on a more formal basis with all faculty and all staff. This is just a list of accommodations that all teachers are able to provide at any time for any student. Another initiative that I've worked with the assistant superintendent on is to bring um, a documentary called Angst into the building. It looks like we are going to have some support from EB Hope on that and we will be viewing that in March. We have to do all of the viewings here at the high school, but we've set it up in four or five different viewings, I believe, one for the community, one for parents to pre-screen, one for parents of students five through eight to come and view, and then we will be showing it in school to students nine through 12. When do you anticipate doing that? Say it again, please. When do you anticipate doing that? The dates that we have, um, or March 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th, that, that week. I think it's several different samples. So I just gave the principals that information. We're gonna solidify the times that we will do those evening presentations. And I know that we wanna do one afternoon presentation at around 3.30, in case that's better for some members of the community. And so there'll be a couple of evening presentations and the students will view it in school. Thank you. So that is all about anxiety. How to, you know, experts, students, students' voice. It's supposed to be, it's fairly well renowned. So we're bringing that into the school in March. Karen, this was, uh, uh, Karen, um, this was school specific yesterday, the question that came through on uh, physical education. We did add that teacher this year for wellness and phys ed at the seventh, eighth grade, yes. or seventh through 12 building here at the high school. You don't have the schedule completed for next year for all the students, but could you just highlight that? Because that was a question that came. Yeah, so the question as the I, I read it was, will we gonna continue with the current model? I think that is our plan to continue with the current model of all seventh and all eighth graders having PE all year long. <clears throat> Ninth grade will be hard scheduled into PE because it is a graduation requirement. And in order to get, um, as I think Jeff mentioned earlier, that we're gonna hard schedule them into two business classes so that their schedule will be a little bit more confined and open up more of the electives to the older grades. Seventh and eighth, um, with the four teachers, the maximum gym class so far, first semester or second semester has been a total of 44, which is a high number. But in order to accommodate all of them, that is, you know, that was a decision that was made at the building level. And there are two classrooms in the high school that are devoted as health rooms or secondary gym sites. So I know that they've pulled ping pong tables out into the lobby of the foyer, as well as the, it gives the opportunity for the teachers to rotate. There's one room that's set up for a little bit more yoga and stretching, and there's another room that they're using for a little bit more flexibility, maybe some weight training, so that it gets um, some of the students out of the gym so that not everybody is in the gym at the same time, as well as using outdoor. But with the addition of the fifth person that does not have a specific caseload, that, that number is just being shared across the board with that fifth teacher. But for next year, there will be. And the next year we'll continue so that that teacher would have, so those numbers should go down to in the 30s, which is much more reasonable, or even high 20s. So for seventh and eighth graders, gym both years throughout the year. That's the current, current yes. model, okay. Yeah. We just came off of our health and curriculum, health and wellness curriculum review, and health is a standard that is in place for sixth through 12th grade. Mm -hmm. And that is probably the biggest area that we found that we were not meeting those standards. So that, that gym um, slot won't necessarily be physical education. It could incorporate more health. Absolutely. Okay. With the extended period, they should be able to rotate through so that they're getting some physical activity and following up with a health education component or vice versa so that they would be able to rotate through those other two rooms. That's why we designated those two rooms for sort of that health PE piece. Is that what, is that going into place more next year early well it's hopefully that model is going to continue that's the model that should be in place right now that would be a question for mrs Silvia. yeah based on let me just jump in based on um what it currently looks like there are some tweaking to do we, we've been sitting down with our um physical education and wellness um, teachers to incorporate more of the classroom take a group of, we have the two classrooms 
take two groups, bring them into the classroom, establish smaller mini lessons, two week, three week mini lessons, and then those kids would rotate back into the, act, the physical activity of the wellness program, and then another group of students. So with the, with the additional uh, staff member, we, we now can alleviate those numbers and free up the space in the gymnasium. And when the weather gets nicer, we can also have, we have a larger space outside that we can utilize the track, the, the field, right. um, the tennis court. So uh, it's, it's really the, the difficulty of New England weather. Everyone's on top of each other. And it also gives us um, more vision and supervision uh, in the locker room areas. So, so that's the goal. We're, we're gonna consistently look at it and reflect on it and tweak it. And we're gonna, safety is our number one priority. We are absolutely going to make sure our kids are supervised, the numbers are reasonable, and that we can uh, make sure they are getting that, that, that um, accreditation basically from the state so we can follow through on that as well um, to make sure all our students from seven to 12 are, are getting uh, that component. Having all seventh and eighth graders in gym all year has also allowed us the opportunity this year to have our school resource officer come in and do lessons with the Botvin Life Skills Program, which some of those lessons are being taught in conjunction with the PE teacher because they fall under a health component. Some are being taught specifically by the school resource officer because they replace some of the DARE lessons from the past. Some of them are going to be taught in conjunction with guidance because they fall under a social emotional category. So it, it allows us to, to use or have access to the students during those times and to be able to get more of these skills across the board. And we can say that we're doing it to all seventh grade students because they all have gym. Mm -hmm. And eighth grade. Thank you. Great. Thank mm -hmm. you very Thank you. much. Thank you. Does that cover that gym question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Karen or mm -hmm. Jake? Okay. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. There was an update on Insight. Um, <laughs> We are currently and still in a discussion over the current uh, the contract with Insight. Um, Insight is an out-of-state company that is coming into Massachusetts. We are their second school district that they were going to work with uh, during the contractual negotiations with Mr. Shea and Mr. Dominello. Um, they had made a mistake because they're coming in from a district or maybe not a mistake. They just didn't encompass something. Uh, I know that Mr. Dominello and Insight now, and they, and they sold the company in, in this time as well. Um, it was purchased by another company that does subbing um, and is now called? Kelly. 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 Um, and now we are working with the same attorneys but now called Kelly um, and we're just waiting for them to get into the district uh, for the subs. Uh, we have a lot of maternity leaves this year, which is wonderful. Um, we are trying very hard to make sure that the maternity leaves are, because those are our longest leaves um, usually, um, and we are making sure, trying to make sure that we have um, subs ready and available for those positions. So far, so good. Um, Mrs. Byrne has someone out right now. Um, Mr. Gentile has someone out right now. The high school will be coming up. Um, I have one right now. I have one right now and then in a few weeks. Um, so we're trying to fill those positions and keep those positions going, but I will give you another update on Insight on when uh, we hear from our attorneys on that. Because um, it, it's, it's out of our hands at this time. It's with the contract. Are we still looking this school year for that to be implemented based on whatever we agree, or is that a we are. I mean, as uh, we have continued to hire and continue to bring in subs, we're still on, uh, we still advertise on a daily basis. We still get um, a lot of inquiry and we do have people coming up to um, apply for positions. We are hiring on a daily basis um, or weekly basis when we can get two or three people to come in. We bring them in and we try to get them. Everybody's in the same position. I know that. I know that. Uh, Tim, you're in West Bridgewater. I know that we, we struggle between Dr. Oakley and myself and uh, Dr. Swenson over in Bridgewater a and pulling each other subs, um, trying to get them, you know, to stay with us for a little bit longer. And We definitely will probably not steal any of yours when you 
Yeah. Yeah. So, but we're getting we're getting uh, we're not doing too bad at maintaining so far. Uh, we had a tough time prior to Christmas um, vacation. We haven't been too bad in January. We're still trying to get more subs. Um, it's hard. It's the flu season. A lot of kids going out. I think Kate the other day at the high school we had 11. Kate had 23. One day, I think it was, we, we started about, uh, I think the nurses said about 9.05 it started, right as they came off the buses. Kate was up to 23 by about, I don't know, 10. Once one starts, <laughs> right? Yeah, so very early. So um, a reminder, if your child is sick, please keep them home, get them better, and send them back. Um, there's nothing worse for a child or for you um, to have the child come in and still not be ready to, to come back, especially at the elementary level. Um, it's, it's tough for them, and I know it's tough for you to even allow them out of your sight uh, when they are sick, but um, we don't want to infect everybody else. And I know that when one, one goes down in a, a small classroom, we usually get many more that are infected. So it has gone through the district. It's still here in the district, um, knock on wood. Um, we're, holding our, we're holding our own a little bit, but. Um, please keep your child home if they are sick, um, get them better, um, and then, then send them back. That's what I have on insight. Oh. I do have a question particular to subs, and maybe it's better answered by um, Mr. Sylvia. Here at the high school, I know sometimes it's a struggle to get a sub in the classroom. What is the process if there is a classroom without a sub present? Well, if we don't have a sub for a, a staff member, what we do is we, um, we look towards, we've, Mr. Bosch has put out a, um, a request and a lot of staff volunteered to give up um, their prep to cover uh, during that. We try not to abuse that because, you know, prep is very important um, for all our staff. Uh, we also utilize our lead teachers who've been unbelievable this year, helping us out, volunteering. You need us, let us know. Um, so we try to, sprinkle uh, a little bit everybody really does pitch in uh, they've been amazing uh, it's it's it was rough for a little while but um, again I think I think the staff really rallied as far as assistance goes um, we can't thank them enough for what they've done uh, it really it does take a village um, because it really that's exactly what that that entails uh, unfortunately there have been a couple instances where um, there's been a little mm -hmm. miscommunication but we try to close those up as quickly as possible um, and actually believe it or not the students are great about saying yeah there's no one in the room <laughs> and the certain next, students the right? next <laughs> next door teacher will open the door and, and let us know so we can make sure we get the right fit and the right person in there uh, it is a long period for no one to be in there but there's everyone is to our best ability is under supervision so it's been a it's mr. Bosch and I are greatly appreciative of our staff for, for stepping up and assisting us on that are you still using subs to do multiple classrooms in the auditorium or in the cafeteria? We are not, actually. We are, we are in the classrooms. So it's been amazing. Um, the subs that come in have offered to uh, cover a couple classes. Uh, so when they have their prep, they've offered to, to jump into another class as well. So it's, it's, it's a big puzzle in the morning for Mr. Bosch, and he does a great job. He's, he's up at about 4 o'clock, and, and he's already trying to formulate it. He, was here till about 4:30 this afternoon, already prepping for tomorrow. So, um, with we have a few uh, PD people, to, PD uh, issues tomorrow. So he's he's already got that established. So when he does come in at 6:30, he's everything's ready to go by seven. So he, he's been doing a great job. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. All set. Next up, we have um, Strategic Plan 1A, Curriculum, and 1B, Instruction, Jennifer McPartland and Mrs. Deb Dupre. Welcome. Jen, are you going up on this? Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. We're here back again to provide a mid-year update. We had seen you at the beginning of the year. We were talking about our goals and what our plans were for the year regarding curriculum and instruction, which is part of our strategic plan. And today we're just going to highlight some of the accomplishments that our teachers and staff have made so far and where we tend to go towards the end of the year. 
And I'm happy to say that we've made a lot of progress in lots of different areas, and we will continue to do so with the cooperation and help of everyone involved, from teachers, administration, uh, to our support staff, and it takes a village, as someone had said. So we're looking forward to sharing with you some of our highlights, um, and again, look forward to updating you again towards the end of the year. So the first one that we're going to talk about is our curriculum review cycle. Jen? All right, good evening. So um, as you're aware, we have a six-year curriculum review cycle, and that's where we evaluate our current materials. We pilot anything new. Um, we recheck the standards, which are always being changed on us. Um, and that's how we determine where we're going to allocate funds. So this particular year, we are overlapping with last year. Um, there was a health wellness guidance review year last year, but the standards um, still aren't finalized by DASI, so we wanted to give them a little bit more time to make sure that we have things exactly in place. So there were funds allocated last year for that, and then also there will be some this year that will go towards that programming, just like Mrs. Clifford had shared. Um, right now, we're working on history, social studies, and foreign language. We have a number of pilots going on uh, throughout the district in all of those areas. And our teachers in the next couple of uh, weeks will be completing evaluations on the materials that are currently in place or the ones that they've been piloting. And it is, it is kind of a rigorous um, you know, review process for us. Uh, the teachers are asked to look at you know, the usability of the materials, um, the alignment to the standards, how accessible they are, the rigor, the practices, and then also the variety of assessments that different materials will offer us. And um, once we get all of that information back, we'll be meeting with um, all of the teachers who piloted and all of those who would be involved in this um, and actually be using these materials. And we'll make decisions about moving forward about how we want to allocate the funds to the different areas and um, get things in place before the beginning of next school year. Um, for next year, uh, that review cycle is um, a huge year. It's English language arts. So uh, there are tons of moving parts with English language arts because it encompasses every content area, not just ELA, but then also you have to look at things like foundational skills at the elementary level all the way up to comprehension and writing and spelling and grammar. So there's a number of areas and you're never going to find a program that fits all of that. So we're going to have a lot of moving pieces next year. So um, there's lots of closets going on right now at the different buildings where we're getting samples shipped to us to kind of look at things already because we want to get some pilots in place for the fall for next year. And this would be where college readiness writing and comprehension would be incorporated? Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. It's a big one. <laughs> So, question. So, I know your staff is probably very anxious to move on from reading streets to something else. Yep. Um, do all the teachers trial something, or do they? Just, is it volunteer basis, or do, do they all play? Do all the ELA teachers play a role in? Yes. So, I know, like in in the um, pilots we've done so far up to this point, we've been able to usually like split a grade level in half. And so, if there's eight teachers, four of them would pilot one program, and four would pilot the other, gotcha. so that they can also talk amongst themselves, but also vertically. Gotcha. Yep. Perfect. Great. All right. The next piece we just want to highlight is universal design for learning. Of course, that has been a district initiative. So we do have a district team that learns about UDL, and that's been going on uh, for a couple years now in the district. But we also have school-based teams, and those school-based teams have met and they've decided, decided on an area of focus for this year. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Mitchell School, because obviously that's the school I'm most familiar with and how we're going to proceed forward in the area that we've decided to focus on, and that is providing options for sustaining effort and persistence with students. This is something that the teachers decided that they really want to focus on because it's an area in which they want to see students improve. Now, what Mr. Gentile has done is he's presented at a staff meeting a rubric, and teachers got to evaluate where they feel they're at currently on that rubric in terms of the engagement process with students in this area. Are they emerging? Are they proficient? Or they feel like they're heading towards an expert learner? What we'd like to see as they learn and gain new information, them to rate themselves again and see growth in certain areas. The areas of focus are actually um, very specific. So they include really heightening the salience of goals and objectives. So one thing that as administrators we have talked about with teachers is posting the objectives so that kids know what the focus is of the lesson. This takes it to another level. It's more about do the kids understand the objective? 
Can they put it in kid-friendly terms? Is it revisited throughout the lesson? And is it brought back at the end of the lesson? And that's something that Mr. Gentile reviewed and explained with our sixth grade teachers today during PLC, and we'll be doing so throughout the week. We also are looking at different resources so that we can challenge different groups of students. So kids may be looking at a primary source that is of a certain level, and other kids may be watching a video, but it's providing options for students so that they can get information at their own level, but also provide them with challenging opportunities as well. We're also looking at fostering collaboration and community within the classroom. A lot of teachers do that currently, and it's really looking at how we develop our groups in the classroom, uh, looking at do students have roles and responsibilities that are distinct, and do they accomplish those roles and tasks, and are they kept on task? And then the last thing that we'll be looking at at the middle school is something that personally I've always been interested in as an evaluator, and that is the role of mastery feedback Feedback to students on how they're doing, that it's timely, that it's specific, that it's frequent. Um, and we're moving away from saying just good job, kids, to what did you do a good job on? You did a really good job on identifying those three reasons for the cause of the revolution. Let's see if we can find one more together in these resources. So it's giving that feedback to students that will take them to the next level and to continue to improve in their understanding and their achievement. So those are the things that we'll be targeting at the Mitchell School. Now, each team on the UDL team at each school decided on a different area of focus. And Mrs. McPartland's going to talk about those two schools. Right, which is funny because I'm part of the Mitchell School team. But yes. So for Central School, uh, they shared with me that they are looking at the overall implementation of the practices of UDL. And one of the ways they started to do that was modeling uh, with small groups what those practices would look like if you were working in small groups with students. And then they're moving forward by looking at upcoming lessons and the standards through the lens of UDL. So really taking a look at um, a normal lesson that they're about to do and how can they apply those practices. Uh, same thing at the junior senior high school. They are looking at all of the principles and they, are, they first reflected on their current practices, where they're at, and then they set personal goals for themselves. They had department meetings and where they could implement two to three strategies and try things out within their classroom. So this is like our first real um, kind of spreading out of the wealth a little bit. We've been in these little clusters of teams and lots of things have been tried out, but now it's really trying to spread it and get everybody else on board. And what's really great um, for me as an administrator, and I know for Mr. Gentile as well, is that when we walk into classrooms and we see these things in action, we're able to positively point them out with our teachers who do a wonderful job in taking in the information and applying these principles that they're learning. And it's really fun for us to kind of point out when they're happening. And we've been doing more of that, particularly with the UDL focus. Um, also, Mrs. McPartland is going to provide a little bit of a map update. I know we talk about map when we frequently meet. Um, and I know that some questions have been raised, so Mrs. McPartland wanted to speak to that aspect. Sure. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, we finished um, the map testing across the district. Um, and I know a couple of weeks ago it came up, there was a request, especially at the junior senior high school, for some information on map. Um, so I'm glad to hear that that was well received. Um, I know Mr. Sylvie is also going to be sending out that information to parents as well, so that it is in kid-friendly terms, but it can't hurt so that everybody is on board and can and have the same message. Um, I checked the survey. There was a survey attached to it for the students to fill out. And as of tonight, there was already 175 responses from students, just kind of letting us know, um, giving us extra questions that we can address with them. Um, and also, the, a number of them are interested in seeing their um, map results. Um, I know already in like seventh and eighth grade, many of the teachers do that as part of their routine. Um, so many of those students already have their scores or will be seeing them soon. Um, and then we'll provide the opportunity from the ninth through twelfth graders as well. Um, student growth is a big discussion right now across the district. I had PLCs last week with uh, Mitchell School and I know Mrs. Byrne is having her meetings as well. Um, right now is the perfect time for map results because this is where you can readjust your practices. Uh, you can be, you know, you're working all year with these students and it's the opportunity to see which students are growing, where they're growing, and then really kind of hone in on pockets that might need to be readjusted. Um, and then something really exciting that I'm starting tomorrow uh, going into classrooms is I'm going to be working individually with students to help them set personal goals. 
Um, we talk a lot about goals and making growth and I'm gonna be sitting down with teachers and students to go through and look at their map results and say, hey, this is what MAP thought you were gonna do. Um, what's your goal for the spring testing? How much do you wanna grow? And we can go right in onto the MAP um, profile online and enter those individual goals for students. And then even just revisiting those throughout you know, the next couple of months and then before the next testing really gives students something to strive for. Um, so I'm looking forward to doing that tomorrow and also helping teachers, you know, run these particular conferences with their kids. And we appreciate that because we see Jen as our map guru in the district <laughs> and she really has a lot of information to share and offer and as we gain some more knowledge as to how to use all the different reports that MAP has, we're able to take it to the next level with our students so that they can understand where their growth is and what specific skills they need to hone in on as well. And they're very important discussions that are happening, so thank you. And then lastly, we always try to offer opportunities for our staff to grow and learn. And one of those things that we've expanded upon is book clubs in particular. This has been a great way. I participated in one last year. Um, I'm going to participate in one this year with Mrs. McPartland on Innovate Inside the Box. A lot of them have to do with UDL practices and another way for us to enhance the discussions around that area. So there are two happening now. The UDL now is happening now, as well as the one that some high school teachers have started on, so you want to talk about race. And they really wanted to better identify ways on how to talk with kids about a real sensitive topic at times, but something that needs to be addressed. And I, I really applaud them for taking that kind of initiative and really uh, just having those discussions that can be challenging at times, but that are necessary. So it's great they're having a, a book group around that. There'll be other ones starting right after February break, again around UDL, Innovate Inside the Box, and then the culturally responsive design. In the spring, we'll be offering one with what really works with UDL. And a lot of our staff are taking advantage of that. They do earn PDPs for participating, and it's a great way to just have some real open, direct in, in, uh, discussions on how to improve our practice. Can I jump in for a second? Sure thing. Uh, something that's pretty awesome as well is that we were able to offer it to outside districts as well. So for us, not only, it just brings in different perspectives. So I know that I'm running a book club starting in a couple of weeks and I have like a handful of people from East Bridgewater and then a good number of people from districts all across Massachusetts. So they'll all be part of this discussion. So we start to see things through different lenses. So. That's neat. Sorry. So then also we're offering trainings to our staff Obviously, we want to offer trainings in the pilot programs, and we've done so in social studies for K to 7. And again, that will help us decide ultimately which program we're going to select and choose, and it will lead to some good debate and discussion. But also, you know, we want to constantly provide our teachers with areas in which they bring up for concern or want more education in, and one of those was the science area for K to 2. And then when the math curriculum was updated and changed uh, with the Ready Classroom for math K to five, and I had the privilege of attending the third grade training that they had for Ready Classroom. And what was great to see is the discussions that our teachers had around how do we improve student discourse? How do we get students to talk more about math? And how do we get them to explain their thinking a little bit better when problem solving? So again, this keeps revisiting some things um, that teachers want to learn about and know about and answer some of their questions. And I think it's really important that we continue with these trainings so that they grow and learn with the materials that they're using. Uh, so that's it for tonight for our update. Does anyone have any questions for us? No, oh, thank you for all that information. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very you. Much. Hey, it's all good, Teresa. Thank you very much for your attention. We appreciate, we appreciate it every it. time you come to our meetings and give us helpful and useful information. Oh, good. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, see where we're at. Oh, that's it. Okay. Sure. That'll be most helpful, Tim. Thank you for getting the clipboard for me. Blank. I said it, it's blank. Okay. Is everybody sure they don't want to say anything? Okay. Um, 
Next up on the agenda, and Superintendent, I'm going to guess and say you don't have anything else, and Gina doesn't have anything else, and Mr. Shea doesn't have anything else. Um, <clears throat> at this time, I would make a motion to approve payroll warrant 32 PS dated February 5th of 2020. So moved. Moved, okay. by, moved by Trista, second by uh, Teresa. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And I would make a motion, or I'd take a motion to approve the very generous donation from Arbella Insurance Foundation in the amount of $450. And this donation was given for the purpose of helping to pay field trip transportation costs. So moved. Second. Moved by Teresa, second by Tim. All in favor? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous on both of those. And that is it. So I would, um, I, I'm glad that you all, I'm glad we had an audience today. Thank you all for coming. And uh, at this time, I would take a motion to adjourn this meeting. So moved. Second. Moved by Trista. Se um, excuse me, moved by Teresa, second by Trista. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, and have a good night.